Hello. Dust. It's the sweater. <laughs> Before I introduce myself, I made this sweater. I did. I knitted it because I'm a, I'm a grandma. I knit things. It is another book review because I already gave you guys fair warning that um, the next month or two, if not more than that, is going to be straight up book reviews. I have a huge backlog of book review of books that I need to review. After this book goes live, I am going to be reviewing The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. I have The Idiot by Elif Badumin that I need to discuss. Very, very excited about that one. I that was that one really shocked me and um, I it blew me away. Let's just be frank. Spoiler alert, I loved it. Probably gonna be one of my top reads of the year. I said what I said. I have Don't Tell Alfred by Nancy Midford and To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. And even by that point, once I catch up on those, they're going to be new books to review. I just wish reading paid the bills. <laughs> I really do. Continue with the, on the track of reviewing books today, I've got Dracula by Bram Stoker. And this book, I can imagine that the review for this book is going to be particularly lengthy because all in all, this book was just good fun. It's good it was just good fun. This book is ridiculous. It's wild. Um, so this was a buddy read um, with one of my very good friends, Rebecca, who she lives near me. And we were friends before we began reading together. I like to start my book reviews with a quote when I write them. So that's what I'm going to do here. This was the quote that I chose to define the entirety of the text. All men are mad in some way or the other. So what exactly is Dracula about. This is my first time reading Dracula. Vampires have such a significant role in pop culture. And this is the time I was like, you know what, let's go back. Rebecca and I were like, let's go back to what can be credited as the work that catapulted uh, the, this vampire craze that we still have today. Though, fun fact, do you know that many, many cultures have a mythological version of the vampire? Very interesting. I just love stuff like that. So <laughs> this is, like I said, it's enjoyable and it's a wild ride. So let's hop into it. Jonathan Stoker. This is a Victorian novel published in 1890. 12 hours later, 1897. Jonathan Harker goes to Transylvania to assist Count Dracula with purchasing a home in London. However, Harker quickly discerns that something is just very off with the Count even before he gets to the Count's castle. Um, when people, like the, you know, your everyday people in, um, in this area know where he's headed, they start giving him um, crosses and they're kind of looking at him like, my guy, don't do it. And he's like, What's wrong with what's wrong with it? But he has this feeling in his gut like something is off, but he kind of waves it away. But as the reader, you're like, my guy, um, you should have listened to your gut because um, stuff's getting pretty shady pretty quickly. So he does discern that something is off very quickly. This is, I think what people are most fascinated about when they first approach this text is that they are a little bit shocked if they are not familiar with this text at all or never cracked it open, that it is told through a series of journal entries, telegrams, diary entries, letters, newspaper excerpts, or transcribed recordings from other characters. So it's not just told by Harker. You have other voices in here like the infamous Van Helsing, a female character named Lucy, another female character named Mina, who is Jonathan Harker's love interest. Um, you have a couple of doctors, as Do Dr. Seward, etc. Um, you have an American character who is, <laughs> he's pretty funny. Um, so yeah, and so what you have is all of these excerpts coming from different mediums compiled in this novel and this group of colorful protagonists band together to kill the count because the count is coming to England and he's trying, he's about to tear stuff up. And they're like, we can't have this happen. What Rebecca and I really found interesting about Dracula are the religious overtones that are in this book. We talked about how when people encounter the unknown, they tend to rely on the spiritual realm for solace. And if you want to, 
I would encourage you to go back to my review of Mythos by Stephen Fry because I kind of got into this as well. And I like, like I said, I love it when books unintentionally kind of line up with each other. So this is one of those times. Here is a quote because I also like to provide little excerpts or quotes to back up what I'm saying. I'm not just pulling this out of thin air. It is odd that a thing that I have been taught to regard in disfavor and as idolatrous should in a time of loneliness and trouble be of help. So this is a quote from a passage in which Harker is provided with a a crucifix. Again, like I said, when he first goes to Transylvania, the, the people in the town or whatever are warning him they, he's given a crucifix and at first he's just kind of like Psh, this is just superstitious nonsense but um very quickly on it, it, within the narrative it becomes not just the crucifix but also passages of scripture become something to lean on because stuff gets pretty wild pretty quickly it's not just harker because this is told from multiple perspectives there are other characters that begin to rely on faith and the spirit. I don't know why I'm looking up. You know how sometimes you like, you look up to think, I don't know. They start to rely on faith and the spiritual realm to give them comfort because the count, the Dracula, the vampire is like nothing that they've encountered before. How do you explain this? Also because this novel is a little creepy. It's not really super scary to what our what we would consider horror today. But let's be frank, if you were in this situation, you'd be like, this is, help me. This is crazy. I need help. <laughs> Get me out of here. This is the nightmare, right? So we do have characters like Van Helsing and Dr. Seward who are very scientific men. They're scientists. And an interesting conversation can be had here about what happens when science fails to explain what has no logical or scientific explanation. So, and again, here's a quote. I believe both of these are from Van Helsing. Now that you are willing to understand, you have taken the first step to understand. And the other says, for this enlightenment age, when men believe not even what they see, what doubt, what doubting of wise men would be his greatest strength. As society becomes more logically or so more logical and scientifically centered, there are still phenomena that occur that cannot be explained. What happens when scientists don't have all the answers? And let's be frank, they're not going to have all the answers because they're fallible human beings. They're hypothesizing. Um, and sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. But a lot of times in, in society, in today's society, we take the scientists with all these credentials and we assume that what comes out of their mouth is absolute truth but they can be wrong. Again, a hypothesis is, there may be some data to back it up, but it's a hypothesis. It can be proved wrong. Um, how many times have scientists projected something or said something then it's been disproven several years later, if not decades later, or sometimes it doesn't take long for it to be disproven. What happens when scientists don't have the answers and they don't have all the answers? Or rather, is there a balance and a marriage that can happen between science between the scientific worlds and the spiritual world, worlds. And this book kind of explores that a little bit because you have these scientific men like Van Helsing who marry science with the spiritual to solve the problem. And when he's saying, now you're willing, now that you're willing to understand, you have taken the first step to understand. He's really saying, we have to, one has to be willing to push oneself outside of one's comfort zone to seek truth, even when it doesn't make sense. You're, you have to be willing to explore schools of thought and concepts, and in some cases, be considered a little wacky in order to start piecing things together. Note here about the second, how he says you kind of have to even doubt wise men because, um, Again, like I said, they don't have all the answers. They may be labeled as having all the answers, but again, they're not all knowing because they're fa they're fallible human beings and they make mistakes. So we cannot treat these we cannot always treat science as the gospel because again, it's a hypothesis, right? So even those who have been deemed within a field to be considered wise, they should still be questioned. What, especially when what is coming out of their mouth does not line up with lived experience in what you're actually ex uh, witnessing. Um, I, there's a lot I could go on to. 
go into with this. I mean, look at the past two years. How many times have some, some people in positions of authority have said certain things and then um, they end up backtracking and say, say something else? Take everything that you hear with a grain of salt, people. I don't care who it is, okay? These people are not perfect. Having a healthy dose of skepticism is a good thing. If you listened in this case or read, my uh, my thoughts on Mythos by Stephen Fry is just a couple, if you go back two videos, I can even link it below. I mentioned the book of Enoch that is still in some Bibles. It has been, overall, it has been excluded from the biblical canon, but there are still certain Bibles that um, keep it in the Bible as a complete work. Interestingly enough, again, I love it when books unintentionally line up as I'm reading them. Enoch is mentioned in Dracula. The book of Enoch, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase. The book of Enoch talks about human demon hybrids that roam the earth due to fallen angels that were kicked out of heaven with Satan, getting along with human beings, thus creating these what the Bible in Enoch calls Nephilim. So they are these um, human demon hybrids, which is why in the Bible, the flood actually happened. The, uh, The flood in which Noah was told to build an ark because God was cleansing the earth of these creatures that have tainted the human bloodlines. So again, harking back to what Van Helsing is saying is how when you come across a creature, like if you're living in a world in which there are creatures roaming, uh, you know, roaming the earth like Dracula, you have to reach behind science and you have to go to other texts and other sources to make sense of what you're seeing because nothing else is giving you the answers that you need. And again, in a way, in a way that's exactly what Dracula is. He's a vampire. Um, they what they transform into a bat. So one could argue that the vampire is a human demon hybrid or human bat hybrid Um, there is something called a vampire bat right because it does feast on blood of animals not humans but livestock we see these characters referring to spiritual texts to make sense of otherworldly creatures because when you live in a world when realms are straddling you've got these weird demonic things going on science may not necessarily give you all the answers that you need so my boy, my boy Van Helsing had to go a little deeper. Van Helsing, by the way, is hysterical in this novel. There's a lot in this novel that's actually pretty funny. <laughs> Lastly, uh, Victor- um, the back of my copy of this, this is the Penguin English Library edition. Um, it, it does say that Dracula illuminates the dark corners of Victorian sexuality. So when I read that, I was like, yeah, I could see that. I mean, that's not really what Rebecca and I chose to focus on much within this book, but I, I can see that. And I don't think it deserve it, it, it really warrants this massive analysis. You could, you definitely could, but for me, it won't that deep. Now, Victorian society is a society that has, I mean, it, same with, you could argue the same with Regency England, Victorian England. There is a lot of order slash structure, decorum, and propriety. Everybody's very... You know, there's 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 rules with how men and women especially interact um, with each other. Does anybody remember that funny meme? There was a meme that was floating around in 2020 because, you know, we were all told to stay six feet apart. Um, so there was like social distances, like a Regency couple courting. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. And so you have like Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth like spaced apart, but they're totally flirting. Yeah, that's the type of propriety that, you know, in, in, in a society like this. But in Dracula, we are presented with characters, especially the female characters, a few of them, that are rather sensual. Once they're bitten by Dracula, their demeanors change and carnality takes over really as a rebellion against a society where women in particular, um, it's frowned upon for them to express their sexual desires openly. And one character, I won't say who this was, I'm even going, um, I won't say who this was, but because I don't want to spoil anything. She says in a soft voluptuous voice, which I had never heard from her lips, Arthur, oh my love, I'm glad you have come, kiss me. So, I mean, yeah, you can really get into how Bram Stoker is playing around with um, the vampire as a way for this, this inner carnal being to come out, especially with women. 
especially, I mean, think about it. I mean, they're being bitten on the neck, really. And it's, it's quite an intimate place to be bitten in general, especially by some creepy guy with massive fangs who wants to suck your blood. So yeah, it's all quite sexual. Also, side note, some when I posted my review of this on Instagram, somebody made a comment. It was like, did you know that Bram Stoker ran off with Oscar Wilde's wife? I was like, no, I didn't know that. So that's some juicy tea right there. That is the tea. Those Victorians, not as, not as um, restrained as they like to seem, which is human nature, okay? Like there's always the nitty gritty going on behind the scenes. Overall, overall, I said this was gonna be a quick review. Overall, Rebecca and I found Dracula to be such an enjoyable read. It is beautifully written, it's engaging, it's atmospheric. There are just certain passages in which Bram Stoker just really creates this dark, brooding, creepy atmosphere. It's just the right amount of creepy that's not gonna keep you up at night, which I, I don't do horror. I don't do horror at all. But it's just the right amount of creepy that's like, ooh, something's about to go down. And again, there are just some passages that there's just so beautifully written that you reread them and you're like, oh man, that was good. Ooh, that was good. Um, and there are also some passages in, passages in this novel that are just really funny. Like there is this quote, let me see if I can find, find it. But again, Dr. Seward is, um, he's a doctor and he has a patient who, um, I don't need to find the quote, I can paraphrase. There, he has a patient who um, is in an insane asylum and he a little, he little off and he's trying to escape his room and he does escape and he's running naked down the hallway and Dr. Seward was like it's easier to try to catch bees that have escaped than trying to catch a naked lunatic who is trying to get away from you <laughs> that's my paraphrase but there are just certain moments in this book where I just I laughed out loud and there are also moments when in this book where I was I was like especially with Jonathan Harker I'm like my guy Use your brain. Okay, you walked right into that trap. So it, it's, it's just good fun. There were definitely parts, I will say, there were definitely parts within this novel that could have been condensed. What I didn't, what we didn't like, or what maybe, I will say what we found frustrating about Dracula was that because Bram Stoker is using multiple perspectives to tell the story, again, through diary entries, journal entries, telegrams, newspaper excerpts it's, it can be quite repetitive because sometimes you're getting an event and then it, it gets told sometimes two to three times from different characters perspectives and you're like I totally get it I don't need you to rehash this to me again can we move forward and it can kind of drag in those area areas it definitely is a novel that could be condensed in that way so that is what even though we really enjoyed it and it was good fun and we both rated it about a four out of five that kept it from being any higher for us because it's just really repetitive in a lot of those a lot of those passages. But again, like we said, it was just a fun read. Um, I will definitely reread it at some point in my life. I will say, whereas if you've read Frankenstein, Frankenstein is a more of a philosophical text about uh, the creator, and the created and the relationship that those two have and what happens when the creator abandons what he's created. What happens there and what harm does that have on the creation? Um, quite a philosophical text. Dracula is just fun. And we call it the original Twilight. So do yourself a favor and go read the original Twilight because like we said, this it, it's so entertaining. One of my Instagram friends, she's like, this book is bonkers. She means that in a good way. <laughs> and so there's a reason why the vampire craze is still here and why I think it will continue to be here because it's just so bizarre. I mean, there's some wild vampire stories out there, okay? And I'm not saying that I'm a person who is super into vampire culture. I'm not. I mean, I was in high school during the Twilight craze. Um, Twilight is not something that I'm super passionate about. I was low-key really into it, though. Not even low-key. I was into it when I was in high school because, again, it was just good fun. I don't consider the books to be well-written, especially Breaking Dawn. This is a ramble. Especially Breaking Dawn when that book was released, even at 18 years old. I was like, why are there so many typos and editing mistakes in this book? I was like, this is what I paid my money for? 
for you to make money and it's not even well edited. That was 18 year old Lana. Yeah, like I said, it was good fun. It was entertaining. Uh, uh, it kind of dragged in some cases in which it was too repetitive, but fantastic writing, just the right amount of creepy, the perfect novel to read when the weather begins to cool down again. So if you, it would be a great read for um, Victober when the Bookstagram community, Bookstagram YouTube community um, tends to focus on Victorian literature in October. A great one to pick up if you haven't read it already. Go to the original Twilight and enjoy the ride. That's all I have for you guys today. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Have you read Dracula? Did you enjoy it? Did you um, feel like it dragged in some places or some people just don't get on with it? But then some people, I know it's their favorite classic. So how did you feel about Dracula? And leave me a comment below. Don't forget to like, subscribe. If you feel led to, share, share this channel. <laughs> I would like for us to continue to grow. All of my links are down below. If you want to follow me on Instagram, if you want to read my written reviews, I do post this on my blog in case you're like, I don't have time for Instagram because social media is a time. It's just a black hole for all your time to go into. I feel that. But if you want to reference any of my book reviews and any of the quotes and all that stuff, my links are down below. I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to go make some dinner as of this point because it's pushing six o'clock and I'm getting hangry. Until the next one. Again, many, many more book reviews to come. I hope you stick with me.